So the moment when humankind discovered the wheel must have been incredible. It totally changed the way of how we were moving goods and stuff around. Roughly 4,000 years later, we discovered the steam engine. And again, a new chapter of mobility has been started and an even faster one than the one before. What was different at this time was the way of how we powered our mobility. We stopped using horses to keep our wheels turning. We started using fossil fuels, namely coal, gas, nowadays petrol and diesel, to power our mobility. In the 19th century, the focus from only moving goods from one point to another changed to also move people from one point to another. And especially in the second half of the 20th century, mobility became individual. And if you're asking me, what means mobility to me? Then my answer is this. To me, mobility means freedom. Mobility equals to freedom for me. As I was a child, I had the possibility to stay in touch with one half of my family because the other half was hundreds of kilometers away. Today, as a grown-up, I'm free to hop on my car and within an hour, I'm in the Alps and free for the next adventure of hiking or climbing. But besides our personal needs for mobility, there is also an economic perspective to it. Think of everything you're buying. Your clothing, your shoes, your food. Everything somehow needs to reach you or the shops where you're buying it. So there is two sides of the story. The one side is our personal and our economic perspective. And the second side is the price tag we're paying for this. And on this price tag, we can read that 15 to 20 percent of global CO2 emissions come from mobility. And as a result, mobility is the second largest emitter of CO2 emissions. And with this, we managed to get into the climate crisis. And now we are forced again to open up another chapter of mobility, which at this time must be called the electrification of mobility. And as you've noticed, mobility has been a very important part of my life so far. And due to that, we even, together with three friends, founded a company who's active in this field. And we didn't start at this new chapter of mobility, obviously. Roughly 15 years ago, in 2008, the first electric cars commercialized hit our roads. And that was when we started. Now, 15 years have passed. The question is, what have we reached so far? The bad answer is, not too much. And to be, to be a bit more precise, we are not even close to the point that we could say we successfully electrified our mobility sector. We have roughly 1.3 billion cars and trucks on our roads in the world, and only 1% has been electrified so far. And as there hasn't been much of a progress, there is the question, why is that? Why hasn't there been more progress? And let me answer this question from my perspective. The first point is, that when you think of the combustion engine, as we know it from today, it took us more than 200 years to develop it that far. If we replicate this to the electrification of our mobility, then this means that we're just at the beginning of using this technology in a way we're doing it now. I don't want to say that it will take another 200 years to successfully electrify our mobility sector. But what is true for sure, that there is still a huge space for improvement and innovation. The second point is, centuries have learned us that mobility has the purpose to move us 
or to move goods around. And that's it. But as we are starting to change the way how we power mobility, we must also think of how we maybe could change the purpose of the vehicles we are using for mobility. Let me make this a bit more clear on an example. I'm pretty sure that some of you in this room are using solar panels on their rooftop to charge an energy storage in their basement. And the reason why is that we can generate out of wind and sun power when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining. But this doesn't necessarily always match our demand of power. So we somehow need to make sure that we can store the energy we are producing. And this is what we're doing with our basement stores. And now think of your electric car. Your electric car is also using a battery storage. And the capacity of this battery storage in your car is most of the time significantly higher than the one you're using in your basement. So, at least in Germany, on average, every one of us is using his or her car one hour per day. So basically, there is 23 hours left per day where you could use your car for a different purpose. And the energy storage, which is in your car, using for a different purpose. So does it make sense to you to only use it for one hour per day? I guess no. It doesn't make sense. And that's what I'm talking about. Changing mobility doesn't simply mean to replace a combustion engine by an electric motor and a fuel tank by a battery. That's not the way. When we change the power of mobility, we also must rethink the purpose of how we are using our vehicles, which in the future will be in millions on our street. So to extend the example I gave you before, imagine you're having an electric car. In the morning, you're driving to the office and plugging your car to recharge it, obviously. So at this point, your car gets a part of the public electricity grid. But it's only a one-way connection, so it can be charged. But what if we would have the possibility to make this a proactive both-way connection? So that we not can only charge our battery in the car, but also use our car as a part of our daily power supply. So if the car has the possibility to feed back electricity, it also has the possibility to provide a really important part of our daily energy consumption. And this is of course not only true for public grids, this is exactly true for your home grid. So your huge energy storage you have in your car can also support your home energy supply, obviously. And that's the point where innovation happens. That's the point where we break with given concepts from the past and where we make real innovations. And an innovation is not an improvement, like I said before, that I'm simply replacing components basically with the same purpose. It is getting out of the boundaries which were given before and getting into new fields. And to reach this goal, there is one extremely important point needed. We need people who are willing to take action. We need people who are willing to get told over and over and over again that their idea is never going to work. So imagine yourself 200 years ago. I'm standing here, not talking about battery storage in a car, but talking about the first combustion engines. Obviously, some of you would have said that this is never going to work. But see where we are today. Of course, it was working because the person who were working for it had passion and was convinced that this concept is going to work. And that's the point we need to reach today, and that's the point where we need the people who are willing to take these actions. And getting told that a concept is not going to work is basically my daily business when I'm working for our company. We're getting over and over told that this technology is not going to work, that there is way too many advantages, 
But I'm convinced that our concept is going to work and that our concept can have a positive impact for the future of our mobility sector. And this is exactly the point. When we're talking, we're talking a lot with people from the mobility sector, they still have this perception that a car or a truck has this single purpose of moving people and goods from one point to another. So in this industry, we need to reach the point when enough people got their mindset a step further so that they say, okay, there is really more than just moving people and goods around with a car. And in consequence, to me, this means that in the end, in the future, a car manufacturer or any manufacturer of electric vehicles is of course also providing mobility to his customers. But what he also must do, and there is not a can do, he must do this, he also must provide energy storage and also energy supply in a smaller and a bigger scale. And of course, this is something the industry needs to understand and to implement. But today, I'm inviting you, US politicians working out guidelines and laws for the future of our mobility, US consultants advising people who have the decision power, US investors who are active in the field of mobility, and in the end, every one of you as a person to take action, because together we have the power to dramatically lower down the emissions in the mobility sector, and together we have the power to rethink mobility. Thank you.